somebody against whom we can bounce whatever crazy irrational ideas we have in our minds uh, about something that, that we sort of remember, but not exactly when we were little. Mm -hmm. And we built a narrative about that event. Like um, that mom gave me away because I was a boy and I was stupid. And while that may not be so, it may be the narrative that the child held on to and manifest that all through maybe grade school. He has a teacher that gave him a C and he thinks that's because she knows what a bad boy and a stupid boy I really am. That's why she treats me that way. What Hello, Michael. I'm so glad that you are here in this space with us to share your life story and insight leading to your important work. Can you tell us about the story of your conception? Where were you conceived? What time? Oh, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that one. As, <laughs> as best I can tell, it was probably at the curb in front of my grandparents' house in Indiana in the back seat of a Buick. <laughs> My parents were 16 years old, unmarried, in high school, and um, that changed everybody's life to conceive me. Wow. And, it, and uh, the conception, yeah. once the conception was confirmed, then there had to be a big conversation around the kitchen table in that house about what in the world to do with this problem. Mm -hmm. And what was the outcome? Of course, you were conceived. But tell I us was, a little. I was the problem, to be sure. Um, the outcome, mm. as best I can tell, and I don't think anybody ever, grown ups don't usually like to tell the truth about conversations like this. But as best I can piece together, my grandparents on one side thought it would be a really good idea to get rid of me, and my grandparents on the other side, would not hear of such a thing. Um, and my parents, little children almost, uh, sitting in the middle, just went along. So I was saved and the decision was made to support the pregnancy and my parents then ran off and got married. Mm, very interesting. So what was the cultural context in which you were conceived? When was that? First of all, when were you conceived? It was at the very end of World War II. Um, I was conceived in January, and the war ended in pieces, of course, that May and then, then that fall. Um, <clears throat> my mother was in great sorrow over the, dis well, not disappearance. It was assumed the loss of her big brother, uh, Junior. Um, it was assumed he was dead. There's even a letter from the president announcing that he was dead. And that arrived in, in December. I was conceived and just a few weeks later, I'm pretty much convinced out of my mother's sorrow uh, over her brother's death. Turns out, by the way, he did not die. Uh, he was only captured by the, uh, by the Japanese in the Philippines and uh, had horrible, horrible experiences uh, and was finally uh, killed, not until August. And then I was born in October of that year. So mm -hmm. the context was very much uh, a grieving context. Um, meanwhile, my grandfather uh, was, uh, the, the company for which he had worked making cabinets, wooden cabinets for decades, uh, was sold and he lost his job. And between that and the fear that he had lost his firstborn son in the war, he just collapsed into profound depression and never walked again. Um, essentially went upstairs to the bedroom and that was that. Was that. That, that was during the months of my gestation. So there was lots of turmoil and sorrow and angst and pain, at least on my Nothing. grandparents' side, on my mother's side. Mm. And all of this, the larger context was rural Indiana, very, very conservative. Um, it was a terrible, terrible thing that the 
the little Hobbs girl had gotten pregnant, don't you know? Lots of whispering and so on. And, and um, my grandparents were very sensitive to that, very religious people. Mm -hmm. So it was difficult for all, I think. Oh, yes. Um, and what were the many main values, challenges, or opportunities that that time offered? To who? To me? Yes, to you, yes. What do you think? Well, oddly, the first word that comes to mind, I, that's odd that that came to mind. The word passion came to mind, but that's not mm. really a value, but I think it was taught to me somehow. In the middle of all that other chaos and sorrow, my parents were nuts about each other. And I think I was taught the value of that. I think I was conceived in not only passion, but, uh, but love. And um, so I guess that would be a value. Mm. My mother was <laughs> devoted to me. Uh, I would later learn for pretty narcissistic reasons uh, because it was my job to heal her from this terrible thing she had done by being a very exceptional child, which evidently I was. Um, I don't know that I was natively, but I, I think I learned pretty early on to make her look good and make her happy. So I did. Mm. So despite the conflicts about you know, keeping you, there was love. You had been conceived with love and passion. And I think that was you know, a powerful force. Not only from my parents, but I didn't even mention that my grandparents who were so in emotional turmoil over the loss of their boy, and the impregnation of their girl uh, just surrounded me with love. My grandfather was an angry, distant, aloof, and now crippled man. But boy, I, I gather he took one look at me, the very first born grandchild, and saw his, his dead boy in me and just wrapped himself around me, not, mm -hmm. not with, what, what, not with what you would normally think of as affection. He didn't kiss me or, or even mm -hmm. hug me, but cared for me, held me on his lap, uh, talked to me. Few words, but mm -hmm. certainly more words than my mother had ever heard from him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my grandmother was much, much more effusive with her love, which was also profound. Mm -hmm. And you had this sense from the very beginning that that was his manifestation of love, the way of expressing it, not because he didn't love or, you know, but it was just his way. And I think it's something that uh, you perceived from the very beginning. I perceived it and I, in some ways, became it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a much more, um, I'm certainly a more open minded and open hearted guy than he, but I also am reserved. Um, I don't presume too much about other people. I don't um, ask too much of other people. Uh, so I am like him in many ways. To, to, to my mother, those were not good ways. I reminded, as I grew, I reminded her more and more of her father and that was not such a great thing. Mm -hmm. And do you think that uh, resilience was also a value that you uh, learn from, you know, being conceived in this turbulent uh, historical time? Well, it's a funny question, Antonella, because in some ways, Grandpa collapsed. In some ways, you could say he wasn't resilient. Uh, mm -hmm. He was a victim, by the way, of, of World War I trauma. So he was still carrying that into World War II and the death of his son. So in some ways, he wasn't resilient, but he was a very big, powerful, physically powerful man um, and could do almost anything. And I, I, I picked up those values and traits from him. Mm -hmm. Granny, oddly enough, who was a foot shorter than Grandpa and just a tiny little woman and very soft-spoken, uh, was far more resilient. Was, but I mean, um, what I meant, uh, do you 
consider yourself a resilient person? Do you think that uh, that those experiences helped you to develop resilience? I think so. I, I don't know that I would call myself exceptionally resilient, although I've certainly faced plenty in life. Um, but I, I suspect what I got, I got, I got from them, different pieces of it. From, yes. from, from yes. Granny, there was a, a way of just digging down and keeping going. It was that kind of resilience. Just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from Grandpa, mm -hmm. it was more this yes. kind of resilience. And from yes. my mother, it was, I don't know what kind of, no, I didn't get much resilience from my mother or my father, mm -hmm. I guess. Well, you already led us to the answer, uh, but uh, I'd like you to tell a little bit more uh, about the relationship between your parents. I mean, you told us already that uh, something um, outstanding that you remember about their relationship. Well, they cared very deeply for each other, but they also mm -hmm. drove each other crazy. Uh, my mom was prone to depressions, and somewhere along the line, dad figured out that getting her pregnant was the best antidote for each depression. So that's mm -hmm. why there's seven children. And um, mm -hmm. so that made for lots of ups and downs in our family life. Um, both parents were, I think they meant to be loyal to each other, but they weren't. Both were people who would mess around with other partners and lie about it. I think my dad more frequently than mom, but mom also. In fact, my dad impregnated my mom's best friend uh, when I was a toddler. And um, I know that had a profound effect on me because I know the date of birth of that child and that that day, 21 months after I was born, so many things in my life have happened at 21 month intervals, and they were mostly bad things. At what age did you become aware of this, this um, um, lack of loyalty between you very never. soon? No, never, not till I was a grown man. Uh, okay. I, my dad was a crook in a, as well as being a liar. And he, um, he lost the, the business that he had because he, he did bad things with banks and so on. And we were, uh, had always been poor, but for a brief period while he had this business, we had a second car and good things, but none of us knew that that was because dad was cheating banks and so on. And then some men in top coats came one day and took our house and took our cars and uh, moved us out. And then it was revealed that dad was gonna go to jail. Uh, he didn't because he found God. Mm. And but that was his story. And he found a mentor who would shepherd him into the ministry. And so for the rest of his life, he was a pastor. And all of that was a lie. But mm. I didn't know that at the time. I, I told that story about my dad giving up his company for God. I told that a hundred times as a child and a young adult till one of my brothers said, you know, that's not true. That's not how it happened at all. <laughs> so um, these truths were only revealed later on in your life. So the first uh, stages of your development were protected by this oh you 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 didn't pick up uh, throw implicit messages about uh, this you know uh, uh, lack of loyalty or well I would love to tell you that I was a clever little boy very intuitive <laughs> and picked up on these things but I didn't I wanted things to be nice and so the yes. the man we lived in a house uh, in Indiana for a while when my dad was far away working with where there was a boarder, a renter, and he would leave a chocolate bar by the telephone for me uh, quite frequently in the mornings. And I just wanted to think that that was fun. He liked me. I didn't learn until years later that 
that he and my mom were carrying on. Um, so that's just kind of the way I, I my life went. I I believed the the good things. I believed when I was in high school even that that cup of clear liquid on mom's ironing board that was always there was, as she said, it was coffee. And I think I was probably in my mid thirties before one of my siblings said, by the way, these are all younger siblings. I'm supposed to be smarter and older, but the, my younger sibling said, my coffee is not clear. I said, oh my goodness, that's right. Well, what was that then? And they said, duh, it was vodka. Our mother was a drunk. So it was our father. Don't you remember? And I didn't. Wow. So what was or were the best qualities of your father? He was smart as could be, uh, incredibly articulate, particularly for a young boy from Detroit who uh, dropped out of high school. Just was a marvelous uh, speaker from the pulpit. He could be very warm. He wasn't typically with we kids, but he could be with mom and he could be with parishioners, people in the church. Um, he could get convicted of something for example, he was at a time when it was extremely unpopular to do so. He was the one pastor in town that uh, the black pastor in, would, sh would call when uh, the mob was burning down his church. He would call Reverend Trout because he knew Reverend Trout would come over and help him. And none of the other white pastors were. He was, he was that kind of man. He had principles and he, he could be deeply convicted of them. And how about your mothers? What were the best values? I mean, the best values that, you know, you inherited the hair from them. I think she taught me self-sufficiency, which is odd because early on in my life, she really wanted and needed me to be dependent on her. But as the number of kids grew, she really needed her oldest to take care of himself. And I was happy to do that. So. She taught me self-sufficiency. She taught me, um, she taught me some things about love, not a lot, but those there were those rare moments when she would sit on the edge of the bed and pat my hand when a girlfriend had broken up with me. I'll never forget. Um, and she taught me an open-mindedness. When my when my dad would preach from the pulpit during the Vietnam War. When my dad would preach from the pulpit how bad the war was, um, it was my mom who really believed it. And I only learned that because I became what's called in America, a conscientious objector, uh, which meant I, I would not go to, to war, but had to do uh, military mm -hmm. service that would, did not involve guns. And I later learned that my dad was humiliated and embarrassed by that whereas my mom was deeply proud of me for that. Hmm. And how about your siblings? You said that you, you, had, you, have, you had seven siblings, all still alive? All still alive, yes. Oh, wonderful. And how many sisters, how many brothers? Well, there are two sets of twins, uh, a set of boys, a set of girls, and then another singleton girl and a singleton boy. And what are the best qualities? Of oh, your my goodness. Brother. Well, it's a, it's a complex question. I'll try not to be too verbose about it because the, the family, the family there, there's a line down the middle of the family in two, two directions. One is the girls are so different from the boys in my family, it's hard to even imagine we're the, from the same family. And mm. secondly, the generation that was born later, my twin sisters are 18 years younger than I, are so profoundly different from the rest of us that it's mm -hmm. hard to imagine that we're even related in any way. Wow. Um, but mm -hmm. I, have, I have siblings that are beautiful, that is physically attractive, that are smart as whips, 
uh, again, there's a tendency for uh, articulateness in our family. Um, yeah. Um, the boys all are well educated. None of the girls are went to college at all, um, which should tell you something about the values that our parents inculcated in all of us. Um, but there's a tenderness, I think, running through the entire family. There's there aren't there aren't mean people in mm -hmm. our family among the kids. So it's not it's not that we've all been wonderful parents, but we've been good parents. Mm. But we are all tender with each other. So despite the conflicts, uh, they they were strong values. Very strong. That all of you, um, and many, we are just many of the kids would ascribe those values more to our grandparents than to our parents. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. So yes. Um, so what what are actually the 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 strongest values that you inherited from your grandparents, from both lineage, from your father and mother? Well, from the the value that my grandmother wanted to instill in me was a profound belief in God, and my goodness, I sure tried. I really tried. We would we would. <laughs> make applesauce in the kitchen at the farm when I was a little boy. And she'd tell me about the second coming of the Lord and we'd raise our hands and I'd pray. And I even got saved once when I was about five uh, in her Pentecostal church. I just wanted so much to believe what she believed, but that didn't work for me. But I did learn uh, tenderness, uh, deep love, a uh, great, great, um, appreciation for babies. Um, mm. She had that way that I would only later learn that lots of moms do, but I thought only granny did it, where when you come into the room, her voice would jump up an octave and a half. Oh, honey. Oh, come here, sweetheart. And all of us kids can still remember granny talking like that. And it would just fill us with a feeling that we were incredibly special. And this was for your father or mother's side? Mother's side. Okay, so you inherited this tenderness mainly from your mother's side. Yes. And other values from your father's side. Well, from as you said. my father's parents, my paternal grandparents, were pretty aloof. Um, hmm. Didn't never really... They weren't angry. They just didn't have much to do with us. They didn't come around and they didn't particularly invite us to their house. I spent every weekend on the farm with my grandparents for the first decade of my life. And I didn't spend five weekends with my paternal grandparents in my entire life. I read uh, a very interesting paper you sent, uh, you sent me about your grandfather which I guess, and you started this paper, he was an awful man by many accounts, but not by you. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more, but it was a, your father's no, side, our, our your mother's mother side. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. there was a hidden tenderness because you described this man as... <laughs> <laughs> if my mom heard you say that, she would be very upset because she would say, no, no, no. There wasn't an ounce of tenderness in that old ogre, um, but there was for me. Mm. I mean, and but it was always in a quiet way. Everything from uh, going for walks in the in the cornfields with with me, or through the woods, and hardly ever talking, but pointing out the bird sound, or sh uh, picking up a walnut and say having him tell me to rub it in my palm, now smell it. Uh, and now I'm 76 years old and I still never miss a chance to rub a walnut into my palm so I can smell it again. I think it's the sweetest thing in the world, but mm. undoubtedly because grandpa taught me that. Mm. When I was in high school, I wanted to go on a trip with my 
church youth group and couldn't afford it. It was $75. And um, Grandpa heard of it. I didn't tell him, but he heard of it and wrote me what my mom said was the only letter he ever wrote in his entire life. He wrote me a letter and in included a check for $75. Um, that was just his, that, those were the ways he was tender. Mm. Very good so from he, Granny. Yes, so he, he didn't communicate it so much verbally, but mainly in, uh, you know, through nature. You know, I might invite you to rub these, and these are moments that, you know, are in, in, stored in your memory. So uh, experiences you shared in nature. Yes. Probably, yes. So, so you were very connected and uh, you learn about connection also. And uh, there was a physical connection, though it was, it was odd. And it was mostly when I was very small. He was not a hugger. Uh, certainly never, never, never kissed anybody. Uh, not, me, not even me. But upstairs in my hall, in a prominent place, is a framed portrait of me sitting on his lap when I was maybe 18 months or two years of, of age. He, and he wasn't wrapped around me, but it was, that's a very clear physical connection between the two of us. So you, going back um, to the, your siblings, I mean, you said that, that you, you were seven. So you were uh, one of the, uh, the younger, older, the middle? Oldest. oldest. Oh, okay, the oldest. So actually you witness, you know, you, you've been exposed to babies. Lots of them. All the birds. And I, I, I was actually, I, I guess, I guess so, because when you talk about, you know, see always exposed to babies and cheerfulness and joy of uh, having babies, or maybe that directed also your uh, interest in uh, infants. Yeah, brought a lot, yeah. of, a lot of mm -hmm. joy into my life. There was a lot of responsibility with it. I changed mm -hmm. a lot of diapers, mm -hmm. did a lot of babysitting, mm -hmm. but it didn't, uh, it didn't have the effect it might have on some to this day. Uh, there's a family just down the road, a hundred yards with several children we've watched grow from infancy and they come visit me just about every day. Uh, never, they never seem to want to talk to Mary. They just knock on the door and ask if Michael's here. And sometimes mm -hmm. they, they merely want to have me read to them or they just want to sit on my lap or just talk for a minute and then they bounce away on their way. So it's just part of, it's just part of what makes me happy. So you felt the sense of community, neighborhood as yeah. well. Yes. First, because you were a large family, but also because the closeness of your neighbors and openness yeah. that we don't have now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and um, <laughs> what, so your, your parents were together all their life? No. They divorced when I was 32. My, my father's last piece of philandering was with the local Methodist minister's wife. And mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was a big shamed, shameful event, kind of blew apart this little town. And um, he ran off with her and my mom was devastated and fell into a depression and she never remarried. She's still alive at 90, to be 96 this year. Wow. Um, Dad has been dead for a long time. Hmm. So what was the surrounding environment that you feel added value to your existence as sole purpose? As a child? Um, yes, that you think directed your purposefulness in life. Apart from the values that you already you talk about, surrounding environment and not just family, you know the all surrounding environment that brought, you know, values to your purposefulness in life, leading then to you know your work and. Well, my answer is not going to be very satisfying because I, I found, purposefulness, and purpose 
in the small in small things. I didn't dream very big as a as a little boy. Um, I never I never planned things out way into the future. I I majored in philosophy in college, for example, with no idea what I would do for a job. And then I went to uh, divinity school with no mm -hmm. idea that I wanted to become a pastor. In fact, mm -hmm. pretty sure I didn't. Um, and then stumbled into alternative mm -hmm. service as a conscious objector at a huge mental hospital. And that's where I learned about um, psychology. And only then and did I go back to school and, and not, not even then did I have a purpose. Some people assume because I was in infant mental health for 45 years, I must have had a marvelous vision when I was young to serve families and children. No, that's not true at all. That couldn't be this way of living, you know, uh, getting enjoyment, happiness from the little things, from the present moment, what actually help you to connect with children because this is the way children live. They don't plan. They don't have, I mean, infants. They don't have, they don't, they are not concerned about the future, about the past, that they just leave without planning. So maybe this is what actually facilitated your connection and your work with infants. Not only did it facilitate that, but mm. it also facilitated something else. You've just actually helped me to explain it to myself a little better. I've, I feel very strongly about what our attitude must be when we walk into a home or greet a patient in the waiting room with an infant. I'm, I'm um, very hard on my students when they tell me what their agenda was for a session, what they planned out for a session, and I caution them to back up how in the world can you possibly know what's supposed to happen today? Your job is to walk in stupid or what, what one guy, one author I admire calls full of intelligent ignorance, ready to learn and discover what is there in the moment. And that has fueled my clinical life for decades. Mm -hmm. And you've just sort of helped me realize one, el one element of that is that I must have been trained early on to take pleasure mm -hmm. out of this interactive mm -hmm. moment, yes. not out of whether I fulfill some destiny. Absolutely, because with infants, you really need to be in the present and connect. And there's a very sensorial experience in which actually you, I think you inherited a lot from your grandfather, you know, this wrapping the hands and the, this pleasure you got from these uh, simple things. And infants are all, you know, uh, embedded in their experience, sensory, motor, and then uh, you, they start developing the reflexive, you know, function, etc. So that's wonderful, this link with your, your early experiences. And what significant story can you tell us about your childhood? Oh my goodness. That's mm. a very broad question. Huh. Oh, my mind is just racing and I'm eliminating a third of them right away because they're not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Any story that you're comfortable to tell us about? Your... You know, it's ridiculous, but the, the things that really settle across me as I ponder your question are just ridiculously small things. The feeling of the, the horsehair couch in my grandparents' living room. When I would stay overnight with them, I would sleep on that couch and do you know what I mean by horsehair? It's something that used to be used to cover couches and chairs long ago. Yes. And I still remember the pleasure of waking up with that little bristly feeling on my skin. I can remember my grandmother's voice. Um, I can remember meeting my girlfriend 
in high school uh, to go Christmas shopping. And I can, she was shocked recently when I, because I haven't seen her since we were both 16 years old. And we're both 70s, in our late 70s now. I told her exactly what coat she was wearing that day and what it was made out of and what color mm. red it was. And I find, I've always found huge power as well as pleasure in those, in things that, that level. I get, I get great, I find great importance out of what, what others, my kids, for example, would call fussing, which means I, I'll take a task and just do it a certain way, just, just with great care. And you, you don't do it that way. You do it this one special way. You just you have to follow these steps. And I once in a lecture many, many years ago, told a group about my grandfather's teaching me to sharpen a knife. And I said, hold on to your hats. This was a huge auditorium of clinicians in infant mental health. And they were, I suppose, waiting for me to say something clever or at least intelligent. And I was telling them about knife sharpening. I said, but that's, that's what it means in part to do this work, to take great care with the details to see everything and to not follow a formula. When I would ask grandpa, how do you sharpen a knife? He would say, that's a silly question. You start with the knife and the stone and the oil and you look at the knife and it will tell you what it needs, where it needs to be sharpened and what edge and what bevel and so on. So just follow the lead of the knife and you'll know when you got there, whether you've gotten it sharp or not. That is, that I said is a metaphor for the care that I think Freiburg meant for us to have in infant mental health. That's, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, that's what is about in psychotherapy. Yes. The little things, the tone of voice, the sensor, the sensorial experience you have with the patient, not just the theory, what you have learned in your training is the personality your life stories allows for the connection and the focus on the little details. That's which one. Makes, that... by, which makes, by the way, this era of um, um, strategic therapies, evidence-based therapies, um, therapies that can easily be uh, uh, modularized and taught to others, a real risk to our profession. Absolutely. And that's why I'm very focused on mindfulness, which the, you know, uh, highlight the importance of the present, the body experience, yes. the intention, the attention, the focus. And how does this uh, relate with who you have become? Uh, we already mentioned about it, but maybe you can tell a little bit more. Oh, it makes me uh, uh careful guy. Um, I've never made any money on buying houses, for example, because I'm just too cautious, too careful. I'm methodical. I'm, some would say fussy. I believe in, I like, I do all the dishes in our house, but mainly because I do them better than anybody else. And that's just fine with me. And that's fine with everybody else in the house. <laughs> we think that's great. Um, that works out just fine. I like being systematic and, and methodical about even small tasks like that. Um, mm -hmm. I find great joy in rhythm. Um, there are certain days when I get up and make the coffee and let the dogs out and, and pick up the paper. And there are certain days when Mary does. And that seems maybe overly organized for an old couple, but that's, that suits both of us to, to live in that organized way. I would prefer that to being, um, I suppose some might say more spontaneous. Mm. My, kids, my kids would be laughing if they listen to this right now and by even <laughs> using the word spontaneous because they, they would probably think that I'm not very, but, you know, the perception of our kids about us is very different yeah. from uh, 
you know, yeah. who we we really are, mm-hmm. and we are to the world. And what were the earliest traits that guided you in the direction you took later on in life? Can I just say one more thing about the the connection between your question yes, and absolutely. clinical yes. life? Among yes. the implications of being a fuss budget are that I never show up to a patient's house late. And my students have always found that queer that I was rather uh, demanding of them about that. And I would ask them, did they not comprehend what the meaning of showing up at all, much less showing up at the when you said you would, much less showing up on time, do you not comprehend what the meaning of that is for your patient who is in all likelihood product of a family of chaos and lack of rhythm and certainly lack of um, people doing what they said they would do? So just throw yes. that in. That comes yes, easy absolutely. for me. Absolutely. But, you know, it's just what is behind the little things. It's, I mean, you mentioned about not showing up on time. In every single story, there is much more than what we believe there is. You know, the little things that can be the little things for the for most people, for that individual patient, that individual say means a world. Is it what? Yes. So going back uh, to the question, what were the earliest traits that guided you in the direction you took later on in life? Well, I've already said that there were some steps to get there. So it it wasn't smooth. I mean, I made the decision to, to study philosophy because it interested me. Terribly, I made the decision to go to divinity school because I suppose I sort of wanted to be like my dad. But I, I'm sure I left after one year because I didn't want to be like my dad. Uh, I then stood firmly against the war because that, those were my values. That got me into alternative service. That got me into a mental hospital. That got me into psychology. And when I had done my term, Uh, and a lot more. I did about four years there. Um, I was just searching around for uh, some some ways to use my the mental health training that I'd slowly pieced together and really stumbled more than anything else into a place that I thought was beautiful, which was northern Michigan. Uh, And the person that hired me was a, a, a principled kind of a principled old geezer. You know that word geezer? Kind of a, uh, a little bit fuss budgety, but with a great big beard and work boots. And he was the director of the, the mental health center. And he had been given an opportunity if he came across a clinician that he thought he could have confidence in to send them to this lady named Selma Freiberg, who was gonna start teaching um, how to do this work that she'd slowly been piecing together, but had never taught before. She didn't. She did not believe in teaching infant mental health in the grad to grad students at University of Michigan. She thought they were too young and too not not smart enough. But she thought that some experienced clinicians could, and so she agreed to teach five people. And this fellow that hired me had been given an opportunity to pick one of them. And he picked me and I went off to training and found home. Mm. So actually there was, that was part of the journey um, in the search of yourself, you know, studying philosophy because it was your father's expectation then to study university. So you, you were in the search and then you find, you know, here someone who, uh, inspirational who help you in this search of yourself, yeah. clarified where what your taste is, where what your pre, where your predisposition and your passion was. And you know, I should admit that I I had, knew not one single thing 
about psychoanalysis when I entered the program and I was surrounded by all these psychoanalytic uh, psychiatrists and social workers. It's a wonder they put up with me even a little. So it doesn't, it, it, I really can't say that it was the psychoanalytic part that drew me. It was more the Selma herself and her sturdy, principled, open-minded way of going about her work that convinced me. And then I wanted to know, so who is this lady? How did she get so smart? How did she figure out what she figured out about blind babies, for example? The incredible things that she figured out about how to bring them out, how to teach them object constancy and so on. I wondered, mm -hmm. how, who is this lady? And what about psychoanalytic training, for goodness sakes, prepared mm -hmm. her to work with blind babies? Mm -hmm. It just made my head spin. And I wanted to know, how can I be like that? Yes. So you, you are confirming how powerful is the relationship with someone, the inspirational figure, far more powerful than the theory, than the books, you know, it's the relation. And this is, you know, applied in psychotherapy, in learning, and, you know, the impact they have in schools, mm -hmm. this relationship, you know, with the teacher. Yes. In everything. So... And obviously, we all encounter inspirational figures in our life, and either people or non-human, because also, you know, non-human animals, nature can ever, you know, play an inspirational role. So who ignited the spark for the work we have done and are doing? So can you tell us about them? You know, you mentioned about Freiberg, but, you know, I'm sure there have been other inspirational figures in your life, including not humans. <clears throat> including what non-human you know uh entity of nature or dogs you were talking about your dog <laughs> animals you know oh my goodness i never thought about that nothing non-human comes to mind at all but lots of humans do yeah. um i think i was really moved by that grizzled fellow with the work boots that hired me in michigan uh, not because he was so smart, but be, because he was in the years when community mental health around the world was almost unheard of. We were just getting our feet under us. He was a standard bearer for the importance of delivering services in ways they could be received rather than in, in systematic or um, strategic ways. He believed in learning the language of the culture and the culture where we lived was way up in northern Michigan uh, where people shot deer and, and each other and so on and there was a lot of poverty and so on. He believed in learning about that before we ever dared to try to be wise with them or try to treat them. So I, I honor him for that. Um, my supervisor, clinical supervisor, a man named Bill Schaefer, just died in the last couple of years, but he was a powerful force for me, a former Episcopalian priest uh, and a dropout like I was uh, from, from religion. Um, he just was so firm and clear, very demanding of me. My notes had to be done in a certain way, a certain length, a certain style and they had to arrive on his doorstep on a certain day, and very, very clear, and never did that break. It's not as if the, the day came when we embraced as buddies. That, that never broke, but it didn't matter. He was a mm -hmm. real, now that I think of it, he was probably a very much like my grandpa, wasn't he? Wasn't he? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. So, so actually, the inspirational figure, you also found the connection with your early figures in your life sometimes. Because he also mm -hmm. taught me about how to be, oddly enough, you might think, formal and structured with my patients. I'm not a touchy feely kind of a guy, I'm very clear about boundaries. Um, I not only show up on time, but I also leave on time, even when we're right in the middle of something. 
Um, and, and my supervisor taught me the importance of that structure for the comfort oh. of the family. Yeah. I invited him, my, my first case, a very difficult case. He said at one point, maybe I would like to meet them someday. And I was very excited about that. Ann Arbor, where I was in training, was four hours away from the clinic in Northern Michigan where I was practicing and where I had this case that he was supervising me on. That would mean a long trip for him. So I said, oh, that'd be wonderful. You could come up and stay overnight and we could meet. And he said, excuse me, Michael, we're not talking about a social engagement. I said, I'd like to meet your patient. I'll find my own place to stay. And at first it was like a knife in the heart. Oh, he just had, had rejected me, but no, that's not it at all. He was teaching me a lesson that I would, I would have to use hundreds of times over the years when families would invite me to come for the baby's birthday party or in other variety of ways, break boundaries. He taught me how to hold a boundary clearly without rejecting. Mm. I, I honor Bill for that. Well, also because, you know, a patient uh, comes to therapy because, you know, um, needed boundaries and structure. So it's so important that he sees from the therapist not theoretically be taught about boundaries, but to seeing in the behavior of the therapist, yes. in the interaction. Of course, little did I know at that early stage of my career that I would later become quite an expert on treatment of borderline mothers. And my goodness, I certainly needed every ounce of training and support I could have, could have pieced together about boundaries in order to adequately treat borderline patients. Because they would show up at my house on Friday nights and call me at all hours and so on, wanting me to give, 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 and never was it enough. Well, yes, they are cravings for relationship, for intimacy, for personal, meaningful relationship. And that's where you start from, actually, the, the therapy, the focus, you know? So um, very interesting. And um, what can you share with us from your early professional time? What in particular are you looking for? What do you mean, what can I share with you? Um, just in your early years, your early years of your professional, you know, you mentioned about, you know, the Freiburg and sure. when you started at the very beginning, you know, did you start with infants and families, you know, straight away or came later? No, I started at the mental hospital. Um, and maybe I will start answering your question there because those were incredibly important years. Uh, I couldn't have been more stupid if I'd just fallen off a bus. Um, I, was, I, I had an undergraduate degree in philosophy, for goodness sakes, and a, some divinity training. And now I was a psychotherapist on a chronic, uh, three chronic wards in a mental hospital that had 6,000 patients. And you, I don't know if this was the case with you, it was with many in my generation. We were not only very stupid, but we believed we were very, very smart. We believed we knew just about everything. So in those years in the mental hospital, we were just, my, my best friend and I met there and he and I just had breakfast the other day. We still talk about this. We were just curing patients right and left, <laughs> which meant that we thought we knew everything and we would just go tell people what to do and, and try to change lives that way. It was all very silly and very stupid, but prepared me wonderfully for the next stage, which is a stage at which I would have to acknowledge that I, I knew almost nothing except what I had just picked up along the way. And I was, I was glad for that. Those were the years when um, Martin Luther King was being shot, Bobby was being shot. Um, the world was just changing dramatically. Uh, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. And um, so we were, we were all very confused and trying to put together some ideas about how to be in the world ourselves, much less how to be 
helpful to mental patients. And so I'm glad for that. I, one, let me just add one little piece there. I, I think I owe huge amount of my beliefs as an elder therapist to the simple experience of rounds on a, in a state hospital unit, which were the most profoundly demeaning things imaginable for the patient who would be forced to sit in the middle surrounded by 30 or so clinicians led by the psychiatrist who was very, very poorly trained always, and who would demand of us that we uh, name the diagnosis of the patient. And it was clear what the game was. We were supposed to please him, supposed to make him like, make the psychiatrist like us because we guessed right. And I came to be so disheartened and in fact, angry at that ridiculous show that it would last me my whole life. I would lose, I would have, I would never have automatic confidence in any physician merely because he or she was a physician. I would never believe a diagnosis unless I saw it myself. And I would be reluctant to give diagnoses uh, if that was going to be used by others as a way to sort of close the book on the patient. Oh, well, she's one of those, you say. I'm, I'm very grateful for that awful experience of rounds. Yes, because it was a huge learning experience for you. I mean, you understood uh, what's going on there and the dysfunction and how much actually is against healing against true therapy. Sure. So, and yeah. how about research? Have you been involved in that research? So what was your um, early experience with, with research? I've never had a great deal of, of interest in research for its own sake. I'm incredibly mm -hmm. grateful that others are, but I just haven't been. Uh, so most of the research I've done over the years has been in conjunction with clinical practice, either using patients in the practice as part of a research project being looked at and funded by someone outside, or um, being asked to do something with a population. For example, we did a, a project back in the, gosh, I don't know, the 80s, I guess, trying to understand which mothers and fathers who birth a child with a disability would decide to keep them and which would decide to institutionalize them. Back in those days, it was very common to institutionalize many children born with de developmental disabilities. And we were trying to learn what, 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 were the, what were the experiences of the parents? What were the beliefs of the parents? that led them to make one decision or another. And so we interviewed uh, 150 or so parents all over Michigan over a period of two or three years trying to learn about that. That's the sort of research I would do. But you developed important insights uh, for research, like, you know, the, I don't know whether the latest or you've been working for some time about a dissociation in pregnant women who are going to uh, give their baby in foster care. So um, highly relevant to research because, so can you tell us a little bit more, you know, how you develop these insights? Well, one of the beauties of private practice and one of the beauties of re retirement are that you get to decide things for yourself and you get to go where you wanna go. So for decades, I just was surrounded by smart people and mm -hmm. went to smart conferences and met smart folks at universities and other places. And, if, and we'd get to talking and we'd both discover that we were fascinated by one idea and we, mm. we would, unlike people who worked for somebody else, if I felt like going with it, I could just go with it. And so did over and over again. And in retirement, it's even worse 
there, I can just be thinking about something and be fascinated by it, call up a dozen of my best friends and colleagues around the world and say, talk to me about this. And um, the research project you just mentioned came out that way. We, we started talking and then we said, let's do this regularly. So we agreed to meet every month and we have now for more than two years. Um, and we decided to include, since we're talking about adoption, include not only experts in adoption and in uh, child psychoanalysis and child psychotherapy and so on, but also adoptees and birth parents and adoptive parents. So we brought all those people into this circle and now we just talk with each other and develop ideas. And it was out of that, that this paper that, and this research that you're talking about came. One of the moms in the group, one of the uh, people in the group is both is a birth mom, but she's all, a birth mom who relinquished two children, but who also birthed two children and kept them. And my gosh, what a wealth of information she became for us. And she said, well, wait a minute. I got to tell you the truth. I, I don't remember anything about the pregnancy of my first girl that I gave away. Uh, and we said, what do you mean you don't remember anything about it? She said, I don't remember who made the decision. I, I don't think I did. Wow, where was I? And that whole question, where was I? Meaning, where was my heart? Where was my mind during the pregnancy for my first child? became a focus of intense scrutiny and interest, especially when she then said, well, now that's weird. That girl is now 22 and we've never been close, but I birthed and gave away another child two years after that one was born and I had intended to keep her. I only made the decision to relinquish her after she was born and I can tell you every moment of that pregnancy. I remember all of it. And she's now 20 and we're very close. And we thought we had just discovered gold. That led to this idea, this curiosity about whether it's possible that some moms burdened with anticipatory grief and burdened with shame simply withdraw from the baby inside and from themselves. And that's what we've been studying now for a couple of years. Sorry, this is so interesting because I, I, I don't think it's been explored. And do you think this uh, is, um, will be heard by, you know, uh, in, the, in the accomplishment of a foster care? Your question uh, correctly, I think it's going to be a problem. We have some uh, members of our group, our study group, who are very attuned to what they call the adoption industry. And they believe that we've stumbled across something that's going to be horrifying for that industry to, to hear, including child welfare workers, agencies who handle foster care and adoption and so on, because the implications are, are profound. We're, we're saying maybe dissociation is not best for the baby or even for the birth mother. And if it's not, how can we break through? Well, we think we know. We've made some proposals so far about how to break through, how to introduce the birth mother and the baby that she intends to relinquish to each other during the pregnancy, breaking the barriers of dissociation. Well, say the people from adoption, you can't do that. You start mm -hmm. doing that and mothers will start changing their minds right and left. And we say, well, would that be horrible? And they say, well, yeah, of course it would be horrible. It would collapse the whole system we have going here. We kind of, we, we can't admit this to just anybody, but we bank on shame to make this thing work to make the birth mother do what she's supposed to do, sign the paper and give us her baby. So we think there may be some political price to pay here, but none of us mm. are concerned about it. Very complex. Yeah. 
when it comes to policy making and foster care, probably one of the most complex area. And so how did these initial insights, understanding beginner's mind, I like calling it beginner's mind, develop and mature later on? How did my beginner's mind develop? Or yes, so that these, uh, yes, I mean, these early insights, you know, these uh, under, early understanding, how did uh, mature later on? Oh, boy. The first thing that comes to mind <laughs> is that you'd have to meet Selma Freiburg um, to really understand that. She was a haughty, tough, chain-smoking, um, terrifying woman who still had a beginner's mind. Put her in a room with a baby and a mom, and you saw the most amazing tenderness, but more importantly to me, curiosity. And she didn't know intuitively, for example, that a blind baby who doesn't learn object constancy is going to be slow to walk. Nobody knew that. Nobody had written about that. And there's nothing about that on the surface that seems to hang together until you just are so open-minded and curious that you look, you see the baby lying on the floor, you mm -hmm. see the baby becoming three and then five, and then in the case of some of her kids, nine or 10, still not crawling, still not walking. What's the matter? What's missing? And while others were busy thinking about developmental delay in other spheres and so on. Mm. He was asking questions like, why do we crawl? And she would actually mean the question. She would expect us to think about that. Why does a baby crawl? Why should he walk? And it didn't take long in the, in the company of someone like that to start coming up with incredibly inventive answers like maybe Babies crawl to get something. Well, wait a minute, she would say. What if there is no something? What if the baby is blind and also has not had enough experience with objects to have developed object constancy and therefore there is no object out there? Even the bell when it's rung and causes auditory stimulation still doesn't exist in the mind's eye of the baby so he will not crawl, if you're right, that he crawls to get things. He won't crawl to get things because there are no things. So let's test that, she would say. And she would teach the child her voice. And she would teach the child to be interested in her voice. She'd pull the child up on her lap and let the child feel her, her uh, Adam's apple and feel her breath and hear her voice. And then she'd put him down on the floor and say, say something else with her voice and then say, now come to me. And the child wouldn't move. And she tried again. And she'd keep repeating that until she could move two or three or four or eight feet away and, the, and talk to the child. And the child would want to find that voice. That voice was now an object that he had a mental representation of. And he wanted to find it. That's a beginner's mind. That, that's yes. what she taught us. Yes. Yes. And that's why I use this term, I mean, from Buddhi, Buddhism and mindfulness, because you need to have the, to retain the beginner's mind, the curiosity of a child, the exploratory uh, drive when you work with infants. Exactly right. No judgment, openness. So... That's what actually the beginner's mind contain and much, much, much more. And of course, if you're really, so, really lucky, then you go out into the field and practice and you learn over and over again the risk you take when you think you know too much. That is when you forgot your beginner's mind, you left it back in the car and you make mistakes. You misread the situation, you misdiagnose, you misunderstand. <laughs> And then, then you have it reinforced. And over the years, the beginner's mind becomes more important all the time. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. That's why I've been embracing mindfulness and 
lots of concepts from Buddhism and working, self-development, you know, work. And because only theories doesn't help. You need to connect the relationship and especially with infants and parents. So um, you mentioned about Freiberg, but I'm sure you came across, you encounter other people in, in your life. So how are the important people you worked with? Well, I've mentioned my supervisor, of course, Bill Schaefer. Um, mm -hmm. I had wonderful colleagues in uh, Michigan, all over the state. There was a tiny collective of us, the first five trainees, and then the next six and we formed a collective of 11 and founded the Michigan Association for Infant Mental Health and began to invite other people. Then we founded the journal and we began to meet people through the journal. And all of us influenced each other along the way in soft, gentle, collegial ways, never competitive ways at all. So there have been a lot of those influences. Mm -hmm. And how did you grow together? I mean, you already answered, you know, in, in some way. So how did you grow together with these influential people? I, I like the way you asked the question because it wasn't just growing, it was growing together. And it, that raises the question, why did we not, as an, as an early movement, become competitive with each other? Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know that I know the answer, except that we all seem to have in common incredible humility, not because we were nice people, just we were, we were so aware of the, of the enormity of the task of understanding why does this mother prefer this twin over that twin? That's a huge scientific task. How will we understand it? And all of us had cases like that. So faced with that, we could be nothing but humble and therefore needful of each other. So when we would come together, we would almost clutch at each other's shirt tails. Let me tell you about this one. Oh, you got to help me with this one. And as a result, we grew as a collective and we grew as individuals who really, I think, eventually came to love each other. And by the way, that mm -hmm. spread, at least in the early years, through the growing Michigan Association. Our own students and others who came to the association, I think that that feeling of connection and love was uh, very strong throughout. I don't know that it is nowadays, but it was for many years. Yeah. Actually, yes, and I want to ask you this question. And that you, I suppose, they were in real life meetings. Yeah, face to face. Oh, sure. so, so what do you think about, uh, you know, nowadays almost everything online, yeah. you know, most of, so what is your view about that? Because, you know, it's a huge difference and I'm, I'm already missing, you know, I'm younger, but I'm already, I'm already seeing the, the huge difference. I'm missing those meetings, those empirical experiences. And we still have them, but online. And I think there is a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. I have to say that I'm not learned about it. I retired before the pandemic. And so my experience on Zoom has been limited to consultations and study groups mm -hmm. and things like this. And then I teach quite a number of classes. And I found it really actually quite lovely. Um, I would prefer that we were in person, but I, I find Zoom to have much potential that's being ignored. I think there are ways to connect with each other. As long as it doesn't become a substitute. Well, of we'll, real. We'll, we'll, we'll see. You know, the, mm. the, the, yeah. idea, the idea we had in the early years of infant mental health is if you miss something in the session, either in your office or in a, in a home visit, not to worry. Oh, you should worry because you don't want to miss things but don't commit suicide over it. The mom will show you again. That's how determined we came to believe and we're trained to believe moms and dads are to teach us about the most difficult struggles of their lives. Not just the ones mm -hmm. 
with their babies now, but the ones about themselves when they were babies. So if that's mm. true, then that means on Zoom, if we don't quite catch it, maybe it'll become up again. Maybe someone will find another way to catch our attention. Or maybe we'll have to just watch more, more and more carefully. So be curious okay, about learning and open and take all the learning from experience because I mean, it's a matter of fact that uh, it eliminates online a Zoom meeting, eliminates the geographical distance and connects on a wider global level, which is a wonderful experience. Yes. Um, so what are your main findings after so many years of dedicated work? Oh my goodness. <laughs> we're, we're back to the, the small stuff, the individual nature of this work. Um, the, the findings have been as many as there are cases. Uh, I mean, I really do, I do really mean that. I haven't discovered a cause for child abuse. I haven't discovered a cure for sexual molestation in young children. I haven't discovered discovered even how to repair marriages that collapse over the birth of a baby. The dynamics are unique every single time. And for that, I'm, I find myself not fretful. I find myself grateful. And this is such a powerful discovery. I mean, what you are saying is such a meaningful and important findings that actually there isn't a general finding, no. finding that, 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 that everything is it's individual. <clears throat> we can find the links, <clears throat> but not really general findings or absolute. That's my belief, which hampers us, of course, if we're dead yeah. set on developing strategic interventions to match specific diagnostic categories, that's a problem then. We haven't got much to mm. offer then. And I mm. suppose that makes the, the field weak in that regard, but mm. I don't mm. care. Mm. I agree. As I said, we can uh, study links, but we need to apply the care to the individual whatever generalization has to be then, uh, you know, applied, adapted to the individual reality. Case I, I mean, was, I'd say- case <clears throat> I was presenting in my class today, this morning, involved a child that the parents were convinced was, uh, had a vision deficit, if not blind, at, eight, at nine months. And they called me to their home to, to do a diagnostic assessment. It's a complicated, situation, but the short version of it is that he was not blind. And it was more complicated even than that, because his mom said, of all things, I don't want him to see me. Now she's saying this about a baby she's complaining, won't look at her, won't make eye contact, and is therefore probably blind. And then she tosses in this new piece of data. I don't want him to see me. Why don't you want him to see me? I'm afraid he'll see that I'm thinking about John Stanley. Who's John Stanley? Oh, didn't we tell you? That's the first baby we were going to have. We adopted. Well, did, I did we tell you that this baby that we think is blind is adopted? No, he hadn't told me that either. Well, he's our second attempt at adoption. We had to deal with a teenage mom to adopt her baby. And that fell apart at the last minute, but not until we'd already decorated the nursery and had, were all ready for this baby that we'd already named John Stanley. And we painted that name inside a rainbow over the crib. And now he's gone. We never even met him. Mm. And now we have this new baby. And I don't want him to know that I'm thinking about him. So now we have a very complex situation where blindness is 
thought to be there based only on lack of eye contact, which also turns out to have holes in it because he does make eye contact except during transitions. So when he's being mm -hmm. handed from one person to another, he turns his head to the side, 90, full 90 degrees, and will not look at the person to whom he's going or the person he's leading. But if he's sitting on your lap, he will look at you or at other people. Hmm, what might we think about that? Transitions, eh? For an adoptee, eh? Oh, for an adoptee who spent time not only in the hospital, but then in a foster home, and then in another foster home, and now in this adoptive home. I wonder what transitions mean to that child. Has he developed a means of managing his, his feelings, his fear about losing by looking away from whoever he's leaving and whoever he's going to? So I, I took the time to mention that case because it's not because it's fresh on my mind, but because it tells us, look at how many principles were thrown to the pavement there. How many possible ideas we had to cast aside, uh, entertain new ones, but all the while just keep looking. Yes. In fact, that's what I was actually saying, observation. Yeah. Observing. So you you... You're really <clears throat> highlighting this narrative between observation and reflection, yes. this continuous dialogue, and putting the theory, the techniques, you know, aside, and maybe you know, it's turning for a little help, but it's mainly this ongoing narrative between the beginner mind and the curiosity and observing and reflecting <clears throat> the risk of failing to do so by the way in this particular case i mentioned would have been enormous because had he just simply been mm -hmm. referred for vision services they either would have found him not in need of them and closed the case or they would have found the curious gaze aversion and brought him in for services none of which would have been relevant because they didn't have a biological problem. So <clears throat> tell us a little bit about your um, interest in poetry. I mean, you published a, a, a book on beautiful, you know, prenatal and uh, perinatal, you know, um, period. And uh, you even let uh, children record, recite these poems. Yes. Tell us a little bit more. Well, please. this will be another disappointing answer. I'm neither a poet nor a particular lover of poetry. But I, mm -hmm. I, I have made, I've made a discipline out of trying to capture what I think of as the voice of children about various topics. And so I, when I, an idea comes to me, how would a child react in this situation? And if this child could speak, what would he say to us? What would he want us to know? What would he tell us about his or her experience? And I then just write that down and muse on it for a few months and play with it and try different versions of it. And then um, when I'm satisfied, I would have, a, a in fact, a very young child uh, record it. They're always too young to read but we would go to the studio and I would read one or two or three or four words and the, the toddler would repeat them. And then I would rely on a brilliant uh, video editor to edit them and piece it all together. So the child's voice is saying this story. Mm. That's how the so all how that you, came, to, came to be. So how did you happen to write your first poem? I mean, what led you to, you said, yeah, I'm not a, Point and I'm, I'm not passionate about that, but you published a book. And so you wrote how, what inspired you to write your first poem? I was working on a film um, on foster care, particularly foster care where multiple placements are involved. And um, I got the people that were supporting the, 
the production of the film to just let me focus entirely on how children see foster care, not the broader issues of foster care, but what would say a typical, what if there is such a thing, six month old or 12 month old uh, say about foster care. And they let me do that. So I began that method I just told you, just imagining, 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 writing and writing and writing, and eventually uh, included a segment on, on the, in that film, the film, the, the script for the film, of which is itself kind of a long poem from the perspective of a, of a child. So the child would say, I don't understand this. I don't understand why you give me away. None of, the, none of the rules where you work make any sense to me. I think about my old mom sometimes. I think I've scratched a place on the inside of my crib with my fingernail when I'm thinking about it sometimes. I wish you people would make up your minds. That kind of, that kind of thing. And I, mm -hmm. I recorded that with a young child put the script together on print on the screen and added some music. And voila, we had a film on foster care that by a long stretch is the most popular film I've ever produced. So mm. That was the first. I did, and then one, I did one like that on domestic violence. Someone challenged me to make a film on domestic violence and its effects on kids. And I said, no, I won't do that, but I will do one, if you'll let me, on how children experience domestic violence and what they would say to us if they could, and so on. Well, it, and that also requires identification with a child. So in a, in a way, you identify your inner child. You were talking about myself in the cot, you know, with the, with the child to um, reveal a child perspective, which is so important in, in psychotherapy. Yeah, it's, it's tricky though, because if, if, if that's not done in a disciplined way, then I'm just telling my own story over and over. Yes. And nobody wants to hear my own story over yes. and over. Yes. Um, so it's tricky, but yes, it does require putting oneself truly in the mind uh, of another. But and understanding. I understanding one. that is also a different child. Yes. I did one, um, the very last thing I've ever done with, with using voices like that, about children who are born in prisons. And one of them is about a little girl who is born in a prison, but when she turns two, has to leave the prison. I actually met this girl. Had to leave the prison. And her brother told me a story about something that happened on a bus when she was about four, he was, he was with her on the bus and she went up to a, a, another woman. I don't wanna use your time now to tell the whole story, but uh, it made for what I thought was a compelling story about what it's like to be born around people who never smile, who all wear the same color clothes, who are grumpy a lot and who aren't allowed to touch you. In the prison where I, where I used to volunteer and where I met this little girl, the moms were not allowed to lie their babies down in the crib. They'd have to be laid down by the staff. And I, I just put myself to wondering, I wonder what that was like for the child. And then piece that together with the story the brother told me about this girl seeking out on a bus, a very grumpy looking older woman and holding her hand. She held the woman's hand. So mm -hmm. that's how I go about it. And uh, have you ever thought, or have you used these poems within a um, um, therapeutic within the therapeutic setting in some way occasionally but with great great reserve 
I'm asked mm -hmm. that question a lot by those who uh, have bought the films. And I discourage them from doing it because I'm not sure I know how they would do it. I trust myself, but I don't necessarily trust others that I don't know or can't see. Mm -hmm. I think there is a use for it. Mm. But for example, the film on foster care that I mentioned, my gosh, that could make lots of foster parents and lots of birth parents just feel horrible. And that's not necessarily the goal at all. Mm. Well, but also because poems are used metaphors and uh, a very sensorial, they can inspire a very sensorial experience that sometimes for certain patients, as you said, they can be very helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> what are the most important lessons you can share with us? Uh, learn to shut up. <laughs> um, learn if you haven't been blessed by life with experiences that made you humble, find some because you need it. Um, learn to value the state of, of intelligent ignorance, um, find joy in those sessions where you think you did nothing and find it not, be, not by just excusing yourself. I don't let people off easy. You might guess that I'm, I'm actually known as kind of a tough supervisor, but when a, when a supervisee tells me, oh, nothing happened, uh, I, that just got away from me. I don't, I didn't know. In fact, I don't think I've done anything with this family at all. I require them to sit with me extra time and we look at what was actually done. And we find out whether there was something about just showing up that was a surprise to the parent. And the, the therapist has maybe overlooked the power of that. And so on. So those are the key things I think I would learn and want to pass on to anybody. My my youngest son is a psychologist in Alaska. And um, he just brought me to tears one time telling me about a, a case. I won't get into details about it, but I've quoted him in one of my papers because he, he, he grabbed a, a, an Alaskan kid who was about to jump off a cliff uh, to kill himself. The suicide rate among Alaskan natives is very high. And this kid was in a summer mental health camp for you know, wayward teens, bad, bad boys and girls. And my son grabbed him and pulled him back. And instead of lecturing him or doing any of the things that one might expect in a moment like that, he just said with great earnestness, what happened to you? And then out of the blue, he said, he didn't know where he came up with this. He said, what happened to your people? And that opened up, a, you can imagine, a fountain of discovery, not just from this boy, but from my son's then subsequent study of what in fact did happen to Inuit and other Native, Native peoples in Alaska when arrogant white Catholic folks arrived to take their culture and their babies away from them. Um, and the effect that that's had on generations ever since, mm. leading to very high rates of suicide, glue sniffing, mm. alcoholism, and domestic violence. But my son just stumbled across those questions arising, I think, though, out of an, a, a profound love of not knowing what you're doing but being very curious. Mm. But also, uh, you know, in, in one question, he, you know, obviously raised the, the responsibility of others and societies in suicide. Yes. By saying, you know, what's wrong with you? Not with the individual himself, herself. So how old was the boy? He was a teenager, 16, mm. 17. Mm. And, and in a world of trouble and a world of hurt, 
I asked my mm -hmm. son, where in the world did you come up with those questions? <laughs> and he said, well, you remember dinner table? Meaning when he was a kid, where we would just talk over these things. I don't think he was by any means crediting, crediting his old man. He would not do that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think he was saying, I was raised in an atmosphere of curiosity. Mm -hmm. But how did he form it into that specific question? Yes. What happened to you? Mm. Which is actually, you know, it's, it, it, it's not um, so much what happened to you, but what you perceived is your perception of what happened, your response to what happened. Because, you know, two individuals can, the same thing can happen, but actually the response, what is trauma about, is the response, the response to that event and obviously your childhood. And But that's the beauty of that question. You ask that question and you always get, not facts, but narrative. Exactly. And that's what you want. You don't want facts, and, you want narrative. And he, and he responded with the narrative, not with the event. That's what is isn't the, the, the truth was in his question. Really there. Including, by the way, an incomplete narrative. This boy couldn't say, well, you understand my great-great-grandfather was emasculated by people that look just like you, buddy. Yes. Uh, yes. He couldn't say that. But he learned to say that, filled in his narrative over time. Yes, yes, so interesting. So what are the most important messages you would like to share with the young generation of professionals? Oh, goodness. Oh, <laughs> I feel so sorry for you. Uh, no, I really mean that because the, the choices available to you are so constrained um, if I could gift you which I that's not fair because you'll say well okay then come across give it to me but if I could gift young people it would be with the gift of opportunity to experience to feel uh, to think open openly um, to investigate on your own um, to hang around really tough, gravelly voiced, grizzled, demanding, but tender hearted people who won't, won't put up with any crap from you and will ask a great deal of you, but will, uh, will, will love you for what you give, for what you become. If I could gift young people with that instead of with a good job or instead mm -hmm. of with a an agency mm -hmm. to work in or, I mean, I, I think, I fear that today's young social workers and psychi and even psychiatrists are doomed. Psychiatrists are trained to almost in the main to not have any idea about how to be curious, but to get yes. quickly to a diagnosis and a drug. Yes. Um, and I'm not criticizing them for that, I'm saying, that's the system in which they operate and are taught. Social workers are taught to yeah. function in agencies. And that's not really a very yes. good place to learn much. Yes. And uh, very often they, they have to cope with stress yes. and disconnecting them from themselves. Mm -hmm. Because that's what stress does. You are concerned, preoccupied with other issues when you're not supposed to, because how can you deal with your patient, client, if you're preoccupied with stress and with not having your needs met? Because, you know, the, the, the practitioners also have, they have their own needs. And if they are not met as human beings within a system, how can they meet someone else's needs? Which so, means to me, as their needs are not met, that they have only two real, cho two real choices. One is to leave. 
they'll just drop out of the profession. The others see. become even more rigid and then punish the generation after them with more yes. rigidity. Absolutely. So you were saying, you know, about uh, human values, generosity, kindness, tenderness, and generosity, giving because you always receive back when you give. Right. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, how about what you do tell, what, what message you'd uh, convey to scholars? I mean, it's similar, you know, professor, but scholars in particular. Oh my goodness, I have no, I have no right <laughs> or business to advise scholars no, but on anything. Your your message, your suggestion, your advice. Here's an. Let me give an example. Maybe that'll help. I I stumbled across um, a, a connection that I've had for a long time at distance with a scholar in New York named uh, Rachel Yehuda. She's uh, brilliant in my view. And she was investigating intergenerational transmission of trauma. Somewhere along the way, her mind either became so open or was natively so open that she stumbled across the fact that grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who never met their grandparents and who never heard the stories have dreams about the Holocaust. And she wrote about that. That flabbergasted me for a lot of reasons, some of them theoretical, but one of them is, I, what kind of a person is this investigator? that she was so open-minded that she could be taken off track and learn something wholly unexpected like that, and then report it, even though she knew perfectly well, that kind of a story would not be popular in the traditional scientific uh, press, that children are having dreams of things they've never seen. So. My answer to you really, my, my ad advice to scholars, if I can give it at all, would only be that. Do whatever you need to do to make sure you're not on the straight and narrow. Look to the side. Wonder about implications of what you're discovering, not just what you're discovering. Sit in the lab and say to yourself, holy smoke, as often as you can, because that means You've stumbled across something unexpected that may send you off on a side road that may turn out to be the most important discovery you ever make. Yes. And if, if you are taken by uh, merely by theory and techniques, you can miss that little things, that detail that can be the key and where you're in sight is based on, and it can be the key for healing, or one of the keys. And by the way, you know that part of the demon here is funding, because scholars are often slaves, become slaves, I'm not criticizing them, but they become slaves to the funding. So they're not yes. allowed to deviate. Absolutely, so you actually, <clears throat> convey the same message to academics the same yes yes and uh, and uh, yeah we we are most uh, almost at the end and the policy makers any any advice to policy makers oh goodness you've you've come you're coming across all of my greatest weaknesses here at the end i'm terrible at policy making i'm terrible at even converting what I know into intelligent things we ought to do as a society for families. I'm not sure I even know at a, at a global or policy level what, what, what we should do about poverty or, or about anything. I just hope policymakers would, would like, like I hope the rest of us would look around 
and be curious and and not not just be thinking about how to boil whatever data are available down to the lowest common denominator and then write something and fund something about that mm. that's and, boring and often wrong yes and you the suggest you the um, send the same message to parents prospective parents uh, i mean the like prospective pregnant parents and parents to be curious and to be you know oh of course you can imagine that i frustrated parents terribly over the years they would come to me by the dozens to ask uh, about how to get a kid to sleep or should we go on vacation when our child is eight months old or do we have to wait till he's two and so on parents often wanted me to guide them and I, I not only refused, but acknowledged that I really couldn't. I, I don't know your child. Do, do you mean, will your child, can I tell you that your child won't notice if you go to Hawaii when he's eight months old? No, he will notice. He will. Does that make you feel terrible? Yes. Does it make you want to not go? Yes. Should you go because your marriage requires it? or because your own mental health really demands it now? Huh, good point, maybe you should. So now we've mm -hmm. got not a right answer, but a balance mm -hmm. of the various, uh, the variabilities. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, except that this has been more fun than I anticipated. You, you you may not know that you've just made me miss the uh, NCAA uh, basketball game, which my family oh. is watching upstairs, and I haven't I, even thought about it. I'm very, this I, has been much more fun than I expected it to be. Oh, I'm pleased about that because I was feeling really sorry. So, Michael, thank you so much for being in this space and for having shared with us your very spying life story. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Anjanella.